Leadership in the Middle East can be tough. With the ever-changing dynamics and the constant need for adaptability, finding the right leadership path can seem daunting. But here's the good news. It doesn't have to be that way. Today, we have someone who knows the ropes. Mr. Abdullah Murad has transformed countless aspiring leaders into confident trailblazers who make a lasting impact. He understands the unique challenges of the Middle East and offers straightforward, actionable strategies to rise above them. Today, he will share his insights and help us understand how we can all become better leaders. Let's dive right in and welcome our guest, Mr. Abdullah Murad. Welcome to the podcast, Mr. Abdullah. It's lovely to have you and um, let's start the podcast today. Thank you, Abdullah. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, can't wait to get started. How are you doing today? Well, uh, great. I mean, aside from the, the, the scorching earth weather, alhamdulillah, <laughs> you know, we're good and uh, ready to serve and be of service. Thank you so much. Um, so let's jump directly to the main topic of the podcast. Um, you're a leadership consulting expert, as I know. Um, you have a framework, which is leadership, coaching, and psychology. And this was kind of featured in the newspapers Al-Qabas, Al-Anba, and Al-Rai. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about your framework? What is that? Sure, sure. Uh, first of all, I'll probably definitely want to avoid calling myself a consultant because that's just such weightage. In fact, that's such a terminology that nowadays we hear so many people use. You know, I'm a consultant for this, I'm a consultant for that. But, you know, that's such a big word uh, okay. to, to be throwing around. So I would, I would more uh, redefine myself as, you know, I'm a leadership coach, I'm a leadership uh, trainer, um, de developer, if you may. Uh, I, because, you know, the titles can be so, you know, they can just trap you. And sometimes mm -hmm. you're a little bit of everything. So it really depends. You know, sometimes I'm a mentor. Sometimes I'm mm -hmm. a coach. Sometimes I'm something else. So, but that's just basically how I would approach it. Um, as for uh, my, my framework, um, it, it, you know, it's a long story. But if we have time, we can definitely Absolutely. delve into it. Uh, the long story short is, I, yeah, I've created a framework based on so many people obviously before me, their knowledge, their expertise, so, many, so much uh, of, of uh, pre-existing you know, knowledge and studies and science, mm -hmm. and just really combined everything together in a way that just makes it easy to understand. Because you know, when I was young, I just had so much curiosity on you know, how people understand the world and what makes people the way they are, what makes them act the way they are, and I just curious, you know, like, like, okay, why is this person acting this way? Like, what are the reasons? What are the motivations? Mm -hmm. And that was a mystery for me. So I made it my life's mission to really start to understand this. Okay. You know, that kind of drove me to psychology. Okay. And as I was really understanding all this, like, like you know, human psychology, what, what motivates people, what makes them inspired mm -hmm. or demotivated, uh, what makes them be who they are, you know? And this basically entered uh, or allowed me to enter the world of personal development where I kind of discovered, you know, training and then I discovered coaching. And that's when things really changed. Okay. And through coaching, I realized coaching was a style of leadership. And so that, and you know, just drove me to leadership. And so now mm -hmm. I have these three components of psychology, coaching and leadership. And I just chose to bring them all together in a really nice way. Absolutely. That's amazing. So wh what that framework, how do you utilize it in terms of training other people? Yeah. So what I did, you know, after I've created that framework, I was like, OK, um, it's simple, but so complex at the same time because, it, you know, you need to break down the logic behind mm -hmm. it. So I've developed a program and in that program, we, you know, we delve deep into, you know, the psychology and the coaching and the leadership, all of that together. And literally every topic is a section. And when, I, when you start like exploring each and every single aspect of this, um, you start to have these insightful moments where it's like, okay, now I know what to do, how to do it, how to respond. If I was put in this situation, how do I react? What are the things that I need to keep in mind, you know? Mm -hmm. And as a result, when I've delivered this training multiple times over uh, the last uh, two years or so, you know, I had really senior, very experienced leaders 
managers, senior managers, just come up to me and be like, listen, this is one of the most transformational programs we've ever experienced. Nice. And keep in mind, like, you know, someone who's created a program, you don't really understand the, the level of impact you've had on people. So, you know, at, at the time I was just, you know, saying, yeah, I mean, come on, uh, how, how great could it be? Like, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's a good, you know, okay, I know it's good, but like, is it great? I don't know, question mark. <laughs> but reality wise, you know, when you start to hear this message over and over, and again, like I said, these are really experienced leaders. These are people who have had programs uh, from university, you know, international, global, recognized universities like Harvard, like, uh, you know, Cambridge, like uh, London Business School. And they're comparing those programs with my program. I had to pause for a second and just, <laughs> you know, appreciate and be grateful for the level of impact I've created through this program, you know, and and, and that's how it started. So. Alhamdulillah, like the, the, the program received a great publication, which basically um, allowed me to kind of shine through it. And to this day, I've, I've actually made it a, a critical part of not just the training that I provide, but also part of my coaching, my one-on-one -on -one coaching that I provide. So all my, um, so basically all my one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching, I infuse my experience and this framework and all these things that I've learned and I provide it to my one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching clients. And I tell them, listen, um, we are going to start the coaching program, but we're going to go through this framework first because you need to understand what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. And then this, this is going to help you understand others. And as a result, that's how you're going to tra you know, transition and change and transform your, your results altogether. Nice. So give us a backstory of how did you reach to this point? Like what happened in your life? <laughs> All right. So... So when I was nine years old, because okay. you know, the story goes all the way back then, you know, uh, when I was nine, uh, I, had a, I have a very clear, vivid memory of, of, of me in my room, just about to fall asleep, and it was dark. And uh, it was back then, uh, you know, obviously I had school back then, so I was ready to go to sleep to, to, you know, for school. And 15 minutes through my sleeping process, you know, I just had that inner voice now, you can call it an inner voice, you can call it a higher power, whatever you want to call it, but it was definitely not something that was me, you know, like I felt something much larger than me. Right. And the voice basically said, you know, Abdullah, you're different. And now, again, like as I, every time I say the story, like my ego kicks in, like, <laughs> yeah, yes, you are different, you know, but reality wise, it, it, that was just basically what it was saying. It's like, listen, you're different. And you're not supposed to be just another human being walking the earth. You have a responsibility. Um, you have been chosen by God to come to this earth and serve. How? You got to figure that out, but you got to find a way to serve people. And another voice, or, or maybe that same voice, basically also said, you know, what is your ultimate potential? And that question, specifically that question, what is your ultimate potential became my dominant question. Mm. And I want to spend just a few seconds on, on what is the dominant question because it's so subconscious and everyone has one. But if you've never taken the time to understand what your dominant question is, you're missing out on maybe your existence, your purpose, your life purpose. And the concept of a dominant question is basically it's the question that you ask subconsciously to yourself on and on regularly, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. Some people's dominant question is, how do I become successful? Someone else could be, you know, what makes people the way they are? Uh, someone else could be like, how can I become rich, right? Everyone has a different dominant question. For me, it just happened to be, what is my ultimate potential? That question has came into my life at different stages in high school, it manifested in the way of me taking an extra advanced placement class in mathematics, I remember. It was AP, AP Calculus. That's, that's what it was. AP cal Calculus. Advanced Placement Calculus. That was in high school. Uh, in middle school, uh, sorry, in, in university, mm -hmm. it was the decision to take on a second major. It was me constantly answering the question of what is my ultimate potential? Can I take more? Yes, go ahead. Double down. Mm -hmm. yeah. It then manifested again when I was doing my master's. I was like, okay, what's the next step? PhD, let's go again. 
and this is where the this is where I hit the wall. I doubled down, doubled down, doubled down until when I got to the PhD level. Uh, that's where I tried to apply to these different universities, and I just couldn't get an acceptance. You know, I wanted a specific university, and because you know I, I'm always challenging myself to the best. I want the best schools, the best education, the best everything. And when I hit that, you know, that moment where I just couldn't, like I couldn't get an acceptance, that destroyed me. I felt for the first time ever that. I am no longer moving in the direction that I needed to be. And I felt like I was actually, for the first time ever, like, uh-oh, I can't serve the world now. Like, all my plans, all my years of planning of how I'm going to serve the world, you know, reaching my ultimate potential, it just paused and stopped. And so uh, it devastated me. I, I really got, like, I, maybe I will not, I will never say I got depressed, but I definitely got very close. And... Um, Honestly, the only person at the time that really just changed my mind was, you know, uh, my, you know, at the time she was my manager and she's still, till this day, she's my mentor. Okay. She, she told me, she told me, Abdel, listen, can I ask you a question? I was like, yeah, sure. What's up? And she's like, uh, what do you want to do with your life? Like, what's your goal? And I told her, well, I mean, I had plans to becoming a PhD holder, you know, uh, I wanted to teach university level. I want to impact generations to come through using this PhD opportunity because, you know, obviously I didn't tell her like, you know, when I was nine, I heard this voice of wanting to <laughs> dominate the world and serve the world, you know, but, but basically, you know, I was trying to conquer the world. But, but basically I told her that I had a calling, a higher calling that I wanted to serve people. Mm -hmm. And she told me something really amazing and really inspiring. And she told me, you know, Abdullah, you do realize you can serve the people of the world in, in more than one way. Like, yeah, PhD is, is just one of those ways, but maybe you should try exploring different ways. And that got me thinking differently. Right. That got me to think like, okay, let me see what she means. And so I kind of dug around and saw different things. And this is where I stumbled onto training because training and teaching are very similar. And training got me to coaching because I remember I, I, I entered a classroom at the time and there was the trainer and I asked the trainer, hey, listen, like, how do I? And, and unfortunately, I chose. Well, fortunately, actually, not unfortunately. Fortunately, I chose the word coaching instead okay. of training. I told her, hey, listen, uh, how do I become a coach like you? Right. I told her, like, how can I become a coach like you? And she said, coach or training or trainer. And I told her, uh, isn't it the same? And that's when she's like the trainer at the time. She's like, no, 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 no. They're very different. Training okay. is something and coaching is something. I was like, okay, so what's the difference? And that's when she told me, go to the ICF website, which is the International Coaching Federation uh, website, which is the largest um, coaching organization in the world. And just have a quick glance at what coaching is. And then you make the decision. What do you want to become? I told her, all right. So I go later that evening at home and I go to you know, the, uh, the ICF. And I hit enter and I look at the definition of coaching and it literally, and this is where it was another mind changing, well, a moment in my life where it just transformed me, which is basically more or less coaching is the ability to help someone achieve their ultimate potential, which is my dominant question <laughs> of, <laughs> of what is my ultimate potential. And here's an entire field dedicated to helping someone tap into their ultimate potential. And this is where I knew this was my calling. My calling was, okay, so this is what I need to do. I need to answer my dominant question through coaching because that's going to help me tap into my ultimate potential. Right. And as the year came, you know, as the years uh, came by, you know, um, I discovered coaching was a style of leadership, mm -hmm. which opened the door to leadership. So that's, you know, I tried to shorten my story as much as I can, so <laughs> forgive me. That's amazing. I mean, the ultimate potential... That's such an interesting question. I mean, even if you don't have that kind of calling early yeah. in your life, that's a question that everybody can ask themselves, right? Like, what is my ultimate potential? If I look around, if, if someone's as clueless as anything, they will not be able to answer that. So how do you, how do you support someone in finding their dominant question? So that's where the powerful, you know, the power of coaching really comes in, right? Because coaching is all about asking really powerful and deep questions that 
you know, that allows someone to enter, you know, what we call a, a stage of metacognition. Okay. So metacognition is basically a state where it, it's literally defined as learning about, uh, or, or excuse me, uh, thinking about your thoughts. So metacognition is the state of thinking mm -hmm. about your thoughts. And the power of that is reflection. And the power of refle uh, reflection is the ability to dig deeper within yourself to find out answers you already have, but they were just so hidden by so much either, you know, blocks and limiting beliefs and trauma and so many things that you've gathered throughout your life and you just didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. It's like going to the source code. Right. Like, like if, you know, if there's anyone out there who's, who's like, a, you know, maybe into a, like a very coding kind of style. But so it's like going to the source of the code where it's like, this is the pure code. Okay, and you build on top of the things. So whenever I'm helping someone go to that direction, you know, I, I, there's so many techniques, like a great technique is, uh, you know, to, to kind of just help guide you to that path is the seven levels deep. Okay. Uh, and this is a great exercise that I do sometimes with my clients where it's basically, it's, I think the whole exercise is like two questions. The first question is, you know, um, what, what would make you very, you know, successful in life, you know, or make you very really happy? And they answer the first question, like, you know, what would make me happy is blah, blah, blah. The second question is, okay, why? Why would this make you happy? Like, what's the reason? And they would answer that. And then the following question is, why would the answer to the above question make you happy? And, and it just goes on, you know, like yeah. for seven levels. And the answers you will find are very deep. Uh, they're very purpose focused. Mm -hmm. uh, the answers may, might seem generic, you know, the answers might seem generic, but at the end of the day, it, it will allow them to dig deeper because you just, you don't just wake up and you're like, oh, I found my life's, life's purpose. No, th that's not how it works. It's a oh, journey. Correct. You got to experiment. You got to try things. Quick advices is if you're good at something, become great at it. Double down. Right. Don't waste too much time working on your areas of development, your weaknesses. Mm hmm Every successful person I know out there is gonna is always working on how to make their strengths even better. Right. Outsource the weakness, double down on the strength. Right. So that's another window. You know what comes organically, what comes naturally to you. So that's something that might open a path for you. Mm -hmm. So those are just too many like really quick ways to kind of help you dive deeper. Also, I think a lot of people take this coaching for granted. They, they don't understand the power that it possesses. They don't understand the importance of it in their lives. They think that they know how to be a leader. Let's say a leadership coaching. They, they think that they know how to lead a team or a company or something. Uh, I remember Kobe Bryant said this once, that his physical training is just 20% of his process. 80% is his mental training. Yeah. So I think a lot of people can take something from that, like, 80% is your mental. What do you do physically is just 20%. Absolutely, absolutely. And I love how you've linked it back to sports because, you know, the history of coaching, it orig originated from, from sports. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, organizations, they saw, you know, companies, they saw these coaches mm -hmm. working with athletes. Right. And, you know, when you see, you know, uh, so-and-so club hired, the f you know, this person as a coach for the team, you know, a coach is not someone who's going to teach you how to throw the ball or how to kick the ball. No, that, that's not what they do. Their job is to help the players find different ways to play the game. Absolutely. You know, in other words, you should know how to play the game. My job as a coach is to show you different ways. And the thing is, these are ways that you already knew. But oftentimes we're, you're just so focused at playing one game that you forget that are different ways to play the game. Right. And here's the cool thing. Our job is also to show you that you don't need to play this specific game if you don't want to. You can create a new game at your own terms. Mm -hmm. And this is where it starts to break their own, uh, you know, that's where it's like an, it's an aha moment. It's an insightful moment. It's where you can notice, you can change your reality. You know, you don't have to play at this level. You can always go to a higher level right. um, in terms of right. that perspective. So uh, definitely the mindset, 80% is mindset, 20% is strategy. And um, when it comes to the value of coaching, uh, unfortunately, there are so many leaders that do not understand coaching, let alone understand the value that it provides. Correct. And there's a reason for that. Because the moment they understand what coaching is, it intimidates them. Yeah. And the reason it intimidates them, because 
part of you going through a coaching journey is you need to enter a vulnerable state. Right. In a confrontation state and a reflection state. And a lot of people don't want to face their demons. <laughs> a lot of people don't want to realize that everything in life that's happening to them is their responsibility. Absolutely. And uh, it, it's tough. Like, seriously, it, it is not an easy conversation to have. When you start having very deep conversations, like some of the ones that I've had with my clients, <laughs> it's really hard for someone to be like, oh, man, I, I, I allowed this to happen. Right. And I got to take control of that. You know, I have to first admit that I was the reason that allowed something bad to happen. Right. And now I need to, in order for you to move forward in a better direction, you need to acknowledge that, yes, I need to hold myself accountable. All right. Now I'm ready to make that change. Right. You know, and that's 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 why there's a lot of leaders that are you know very skeptical or very intimidated by coaching because it, it requires you to dive deep. and Not everyone's level is willing to go that deep. Also, I think. Uh Prior to our podcast, we were having a discussion there. Yeah. And you were talking about blue ocean strategy. Yeah. Right. And I can link this to th this conversation. How is you said that uh, coaches uh, let their players know that there are different ways of playing the same game. So you can find blue ocean strategy in this as well. Like if you play the same game that everyone is playing, you're yeah. not going to be the best. So if you change the game, if you play a different game, absolutely, you are going to be standing out. And that's kind of a blue ocean strategy like it's like a sub blue ocean strategy in a very competitive market uh, precisely it, it's it, you know if you want to think creatively if you want to think innovatively mm -hmm. you cannot think the same way you're thinking right now so you know when right. we tell people to think outside the box that's literally what coaching is it's helping you get out of the box mm. and and take an eagle eye uh, uh, you know like a macro level view of what's going on right. you know like uh, the, the example that i sometimes give to my clients is like Wherever you are, no matter where you are, imagine you are staring at a painting really, really, really close, okay? And that's your reality. What I'm trying to do is I'm going to try to help take you three steps back, two steps back, mm -hmm. one meter back. And when you start to see the, the, the actual macro level of the image, now you're going to understand where you are. And if you're in the, even heading in the right direction or not, right. maybe you don't even like what you're seeing. So change the entire painting. So, so it's, it's that level of like, of, you know, that, that's why we try to pull them away from their reality and give them a reality check. And if they like the reality, fine, they, then let's take it up a notch. Right. And if they just don't like what they're seeing, just change the whole canvas, start fresh. Right. I think what you're saying is really powerful because we live our lives day to day, moment by moment. Yeah. We are part of that reality. So what you're trying to say is you separate yourself from that reality and look at it from a macro level. Sometimes you, you don't see the whole picture when you're so close. Absolutely. Right? And when, you look, when you go far away, you see the whole picture and sometimes it's very ugly. Yeah, <laughs> it's blurry. You don't know what you're looking at oftentimes, yeah. you yeah. know. So absolutely. Uh, the, the, you know, and, and it's, it's tough because like you said, you know, you're, you're in it. So you need that third eye. You know, again, I, another comparison I throw uh, out there is you're a car. And yeah. you're inside the car and you have mirrors left and right in front of you, but you also have sensors. Right. Coaches help you find the blind spots. They're the sensors. They're the ones that tell you like, oh, careful, you're getting too close to the wall or you're mm -hmm. getting too close to the next car. They're the sensors mm -hmm. that, the, you know, the, the blind spot, the area that you can't see. Yeah. And oftentimes you need that person to step outside, you know, like, hey, oh, no, 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 keep going, keep going. You know, like they, right. they point at you like, like, listen, yeah, keep going, keep going. All right. Now stop. Right. So sometimes they help guide you, but really at the end of the day, you're the one behind the, you know, behind the wheel. You're the one controlling right. how quick or slow you're moving the car. And you're the one who pauses on and parks the car whenever you want. So Absolutely. We're just sensors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so tell me what kind of psychologies do you ingrain um, into people while you're training for them to become great leaders? Yeah. Okay. So this is really powerful. So the, the, the first thing is I help them understand the science of the human mind and how okay. the mind, you know, um, obviously there's so many things I can, you know, I can share right now. So I'll try to keep it short and simple. But basically the human mind does not like change. Okay. And coaching is all about change. It's about, it's, it's literally a behavioral transformation method. Okay. So when entering a coaching uh, journey or experience, you need to understand that any kind of change, whether it is physical, uh, psychological, 
emotional, spiritual, um, any kind of change your mind is going to resist because the mind <laughs> likes comfort, the comfort zone. And so, and it likes comfort so much that it's willing to attack itself so that it does not change. So like your mind, your psychology is so strong that it would it will counter the neurons and and uh, you know any kind of new stimulation uh, of of new activity, it's going to try to counter it. So again, I don't want to get too deep into the neuroscience behind it, but basically, whenever you're doing something new, whether whenever you're thinking in a new way, neuroplasticity is is happening, which is basically uh, think of it as like wires. New mm -hmm. wires are being formed. And okay. the more you use these thoughts, the more you use these uh, you know, behaviors, those wires are getting thicker and stronger and almost un un you know, detachable. Okay. And what happens is in the first day or two of you thinking these new different ways, these new neurons are creating and forming, at the same time, your mind is also creating an, a, a counter to it. And so if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's why they always tell, you know, like, you know, whenever you're starting something new, the hardest period is the beginning because right. you're, you're, you're literally creating something. You're, you're creating a mindset. You're creating a behavior, a pattern. And like I said, the human mind hates new things. So it's going to try everything in its power to tell you like, oh, this is so hard, man. Come on, <laughs> let's not go there again. You, know, you literally have that in you. But once you cross a certain threshold, it becomes, no, 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 now it's your new normal because now you've created stronger um, wires. Right. All right, so, so that's like a section of, of, of the science. I need to make sure they understand that because they need to know that, listen, this is, coaching is not an easy process. I tell them straight up, like, listen, you are gonna have conversations that you're gonna come out of the session and you're like exhausted, you know? In fact, sometimes I tell them, I tell them, listen, if, if by the end of today, you are not shocked about the things that you have revealed, then I have failed at my job. <laughs> because I need to make it so uncomfortable, but in a way that's comfortable at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I create such a, uh, you know, a warm and uh, safe space that they can share all this all while feeling very uncomfortable. <laughs> and by the time they leave, they're like, oh my God, Abdullah, I couldn't sleep last night. Like it was so intense. Like I can't believe I even shared these thoughts with anyone before. And that is right. the experience I'm looking for as a coach, right? I'm looking for, you know, getting you comfortable to being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that alone is a very powerful mindset. You know, like that's, that's the A level, alpha level, you know, type A personality. It's like, yeah, like it's discipline. Right. It's doing it no matter what. Right. So that's, that's the first stage is, is helping them understand the psychology. Another stage is really getting clear at the result. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we need to move forward towards a certain behavior, a certain action. If they don't know where they are, they don't know where they're going to go. And so it's really very important. They need to understand what is the end game? What is the end result that they want to achieve? And, right. then, and then we have to like reverse engineer it. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, you want to become this? Do you want to do this? Okay. What are the challenges you're facing? Okay, what are, th what are your reasons to even want to change this? Right. You will be shocked to understand that every single answer you've ever heard from a question, the first answer is not the reality. So, okay. in other words, when I ask someone, hey, how are you doing today? And what do they respond? I'm great. What about you? Right. Yeah. No, you're not great. <laughs> no one is ever great. You know, like everyone is... Yeah, I'm great, but, yeah, true, you know, true. <laughs> I'm great. However, I prefer if things were a certain way, you know. Right. So what I'm trying to say is every single time I ask someone a question, the first answer they give you is not going to be the full truth. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. So there's always more to the, to, to the answer. And so I, I make sure that, listen, whatever your end result is, do you really want this or is there something deeper? And nine times out of ten, there is something much deeper. Correct. And we go on the deeper stuff. So I never take the first answer as face value, and that's the reality. No. It's, I go, you know, seven levels deep. I right. go seven levels deep. I try to dig to the root, 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 root cause or the root desire mm -hmm. of what they want. Do you, do you follow Andrew Huberman? He's a neuroscientist. Oh, God. If I see his image, I might know him. Right. He's a bearded guy. I got him. Yes, definitely. 100,000% follow this guy <laughs> all the time. Yeah, so. I just love his content, love his neuroscience take on right. things and the content he shares. Actually, I was literally listening to him on my way here. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like these quick reel videos. Right, so, right. 
Uh, but yeah, he was talking about, you know, many things, excellent content on, yeah. on neuroscience. Like anyone who's really interested in that area should definitely check him out. Right. I absolutely love his content. He talks about serotonin. He talks about adrenaline yeah. and how you can utilize these things in order to become better individuals absolutely. in your specific fields. Right. So can you, can you touch upon the topic of real change starts from within? You keep talking about this. All right, so I'll break it down into uh, a three-step process. So, um, I ha so I have a high-level leader framework. Okay. My high-level leader framework is basically, it's a three components. Um, in Arabic, it's an nafs, an nas, an nataj, which is basically translated to an, an nafs, which is, you know, the self. So, yeah. Uh, an nas, the people. Yeah. And an nataj, the results. So okay. the reason why the first one is the self, you know, is because everything starts with the self. If you cannot control yourself, you cannot influence others. You cannot create results. If you have no control over yourself, you cannot do anything. You know, it's it's very common sense, but you know, sometimes they say common sense is not so common. Uh, but but really, at the end of the day, if you're going to be a high level leader, uh, someone who's going to impact others, someone who's going to influence others, you need to have really great self control. Uh, self-management, self-mastery. Mm -hmm. You need to master yourself. And what that basically means is understand your strengths, understand your weaknesses, understand your purpose, understand what your mission is, you know. Uh, understand who are the people that are important and closest to you and how do you want them to impact you as a person. Understand, you know, um, what kind of person you want to be. Right. What kind of reputation do you want to build? What kind of legacy do you want to create? So, so the more you know yourself, the better and the easier it becomes at serving others. Right. There's a beautiful saying um, by uh, Tony Robbins. And he says, um, if you want to be, if you want to influence others, you need to first be influenced. Mm. And basically, yeah. you know, the same thing applies to, to, to leaders. You know, if you want to lead others, you need to lead yourself first. Right. You know, so focus on you in the first degree. Um, it, it's again, going back to that same example, you know, with the airplane, you know, and, you know, in the case of emergency and the gas masks, you know, pop out. And, you know, if you're a father or uh, a mother and your children are next to you, do you put the oxygen on yourself or do you give mm. it to your child? And everyone is telling you put the oxygen to on yourself because what good are you if you put the oxygen on someone else and you die and no one's going to take, no one's going to know how to take care of like, this child True. except you. True. So you got to give yourself the oxygen, take a deep breath, and then you can give it to someone else and so on and so forth. So right. you can, you know, you can help others. Then. So it's you and then others. Right. There's a book called 12 Rules for Life by Dr. Jordan Peterson. Mm. He's a psychologist. Yes. And he talks about one of the chapters is make your own bedroom. Mm. And what he says about that is people who, who don't make their own beds cannot go out there and make change in the world. Mm. Like if you can't start with your own room, how good are you for the whole world? Absolutely. Th that relates to what you're saying. Yeah, thank God my room is not MS. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I have a really, uh, you know, I have a good relationship with keeping my room clean. Uh, we'll see how my wife reacts to this part. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, definitely. In the comment section, we'll, we'll know what the truth is. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Also, um, when you start your day with making your own bedroom, mm -hmm. it, it's such a positive connotation to your life. Like you started doing something positive. You made a small change. Absolutely. But that can have a ripple effect for the whole day. It's a small win. Yeah. You know, uh, and by the way, that's exactly how... Um, you know, when working with clients, that's how you want to start. Because like I said, the, the, the mind likes to counter the change. So in order to not uh, aggravate mm -hmm. and annoy the, the mind, what you do is you, you start small, small wins, small wins, small wins, you know, like, uh, and, and literally in, in a coaching session, when, whenever we're entering that phase where we're putting action, uh, creating an action plan, I literally go down to, okay, so what is the action we want to create here? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you'll find answers that are a bit unrealistic, like they're, they're big. Right. So I'll tell them, okay, how about we break it down even further? Like what is one single tiny step that will move you to your goal? Mm. And it literally starts oftentimes with that step and it becomes easier on them to kind of hit right. that. And, you know, again, if we want to go back to the neuroscience of that, when you get a win, you get a dopamine effect. 
Right. You know, that that's right. just how we are. You, you get something, you achieve something. Oh, wow. You feel yeah. excited, you know, because <laughs> dopamine kicks in. Yeah. So you want to create that pattern of right. dopamine, dopamine, until you get hooked on, oh, I'm getting results, man. Like right. now you challenge yourself, you make it, you know, you gradually create it like an in in a exponential pattern, so, right. so to speak. Uh, referring again to Dr. Jordi Peterson, he, he keeps saying that um, when, you're, when you don't know what to do in life, you just need to aim up, but aim low. What people do is mm. they aim really high and that's so unrealistic that they just, yeah. the next day they just stop doing things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that's also another uh, challenge is it's, you're right. Like you don't want to enter delusionville, you know, right. like there's a level of um, realism that the moment you lose it, you actually start to lose motivation. Mm -hmm. You, you like, if it's so big and unrealistic, it's unattainable. Right. That means it doesn't matter how many times you try to convince yourself it's so big that you can't accomplish it and therefore it's only a matter of time before you enter despair and hopelessness and you're like i can't do this might as well <laughs> to give up so i sure. completely agree like yes you got to think big but you got to be very careful on how big you're thinking mm -hmm. because if it's so big um and that that's that it's starting to become uh, so unrealistic you're gonna basically you're you're hurting yourself at this True. stage, you know. Absolutely. So that's why you know companies have visions and missions, right? Mm -hmm. The vision is a very long term term, uh, uh, you know, a goal that they would like to achieve, and oftentimes it takes them years to achieve it. But still, they have something, but they know that to a degree it's attainable. Correct. Right, and so so you got to work your way to it, and, and when when you hit it, you got to find something else. You True. Know? True. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I have this question in mind. Go ahead. Um, Middle East, especially Kuwait, yeah. it's a very diverse economy because we have expatriates coming from all over the world, from Egypt, yeah. India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Philippines, a lot of Philippines, Absolutely. right? And so there are corporates and companies who have all these diverse cultures mm -hmm. and perspectives and mindsets. So it's, it's very critical on a leader to take care of all of them while, let's say, while sending a message to the whole team. So what do you suggest for such a leader who has a diverse culture in his company? Mm. How does he communicate effectively to every one of them? Amazing. Great question. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that any leader who is in a position who has diversity is immediately in, a, in an advantage situation. Um, okay. Studies have shown that you know, the more diverse your team, long term, you will have more of an innovative team. You'll have okay. better results as a result. These are individuals that will provide you more solutions, more diverse solutions, more different ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's always an advantage. It's never a disadvantage. Um, now, I understand, you know, obviously, you know, rules and policies sometimes govern how many people uh, and how many diverse people are within uh, an organization Correct. or within a, a team. But that's a different conversation for a later date. Yeah. But going back to your point, um, what a leader needs to understand first is that he needs to embrace and appreciate and love the diversity because like I said, if anything, it's going to add value instead of mm -hmm. minimize value. Yeah. <clears throat> what I would recommend is that person, if they're truly a leader, they would definitely take the time. Well, first of all, they need to take the time to understand and you know, truly uh, meet and greet this individual from each different, you know, nationality, background, whatever you want to call it. But right. they need to take the time to get to know them one on one. Right. And two, I would even go further and say, like, try to learn some parts of their culture. Mm -hmm. Again, what's the you know one of the main uh, you know one of the main jobs of of being a leader is the ability to influence others. So in order for you to be influential to these individuals. You need to make sure you need to basically understand them. Mm. And the more you understand them, the more you're influ influential. There is something called like a, a me too mindset or a me too mentality. Mm -hmm. If they feel that, oh, you're just like me, you have entered influence mode. Right. If they cannot feel that and you always insist on making a barrier, no matter what you do, the only level of influence you will have is your job title over them. That's it. True. They will never respect you. The only respect is the power and authority that has been given to you by the organization through their job title, and that's it. Right. But they will lose the, you will lose the, the, um, the, hum, the humane touch. Mm -hmm. And so when you learn, for example, like something so simple as just learning how to say good morning in their language <laughs> is going to incredibly give them such a high, such a dopamine high. 
uh, that it's going to be unparalleled. The, the fact that you can pronounce their name in their native language is going to change how they perceive you. The other day I was passing by and, you know, uh, and there was an individual that, you know, on a daily basis, you know, I see them and I just took a moment to like, hey, I know this is weird, but how do you say your name? <laughs> and he was, um, I'm, I, again, I, I don't want to be a stereotypical and just assuming his nationality, but definitely he's, uh, you know, either in between, like, you know, probably Southeast Asia uh, countries. So I'm not quite sure which one definitively. Uh, but anyways, I was asking him, you know, like, how do you pronounce your name? And then he said it once. And I told him, can you say one more time? And then he said it in a second time. And then I told him, okay, how do you write and spell your name? Okay. All right. And then... As I was passing by, every once in a while, I'm like, that's your name, right? And then I, I would literally <laughs> try to pronounce it. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> and I can see how just taking that five minutes from my day just to learn how to say his name in his language mm -hmm. and spell it in the same way he does has transformed how he perceives me. Right. You know? Absolutely. A and it's something as simple as that. Yeah. Trevor Noah, the South African comedian, he always talks about how language is so important. Yeah. If you know native language of wherever you are going, you're already halfway through being one of them. So yeah. language is really important. 100%. It, yeah. It's literally the way we communicate. And, you know, if, if you're going to be an, an influential individual, you know, if you cannot speak it, at least use your mannerism. True. You know, use your, 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 your body language to, to you know, facilitate that, True. you know, whether it's signs of respect, signs of happiness, uh, signs of, uh, you know, anger, whatever it is. But you can use your, your even your, your physical language as well. <laughs> Absolutely. So tell me, what are the skill sets um, that set a great leader apart from the rest of the pack? Uh, one of the key ones is the ability to be highly um, aware of yourself, very conscious. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many uh, leaders, let's say, they are unconscious of their abilities. Okay. And the, the, the issue there, the, the, the problem there, and, and by the way, unconscious behavior or subconscious behavior, let's say, because unconscious can mean like, you know, you're knocked out. But <laughs> subconscious, like something that it's, you know, innate and something that you don't even think about. It's just, it just happens. Sometimes th the lack of not knowing that you're doing something is a sign that you're a master at it. In fact, all, all, oftentimes, you know, that's how it is. You, you've become a master at it that you don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, like you, when you jump in a car, you know, um, and you already know how to drive and this is your one millionth time, you're not going to think twice on how to start the car and how to put it on, you know, on, you know, on right. D and, and drive. And no, it's, it's, it's innate. It, you, you know how to do it. And so the same thing happens with high performers. It's the same thing happens with leaders. They're so great at certain things that they're not aware they are. Now, the importance of them to be aware is because now when they are aware, they can improve it. Mm -hmm. So this is one very powerful skill set is the ability to become aware. Again, you can do this with coaching. This right. is the power of coaching. Uh, another skill set, and of course, this also goes into hand in hand with the point that we just discussed, which is self-mastery. The more you invest in yourself, uh, and, I, and it's hard to iterate how many times I've tried to, you know, can say this, but like take the time to truly invest in yourself. Mm -hmm. And when I see, when I mean that, like read books, leaders are readers, right? So right. read books, uh, listen to podcasts, uh, especially ones that actually feed your mind right. and your heart and your soul and so on. Um, get trained. You know, leaders are made, not born. So become a better leader, learn the newest skill sets, learn what you need to do. Um, uh, additionally, get coached, like seriously, like experience it. Just, just go out there, find a good certified professional coach and just try it, invest in it. And you'll start to see the impact and the power of, of you know, when you invest in coaching, mm -hmm. the returns are not even 10 X. It is like easily 50 X and above because it oh. changes who you are as a human being, it impacts your life on a deeper level. Right. So definitely investing in yourself. Other quick, you know, very, uh, you know, th like very obvious things that you can focus on, skill sets. And again, if you want to be very influential is empathy and emotional intelligence. And again, empo em empathy can technically go under the umbrella of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And when you're emotionally intelligent, you are aware of your emotions your feelings, as well as the emotions and feelings of others. So right. you are understanding. Yeah. 
And when you can predict how someone is feeling and it's accurate, mm -hmm. you have entered an influential state that is so powerful that they have no nothing to do but just say, okay, you got me. Like, what do you want? I'm, I'm all, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll help serve you in anything you need. Because you've, you've understood them on, on such a core level that it basically just changes the, the way they perceive you. Right. Uh, a third skill, which is very critical, is the ability to be quiet. I cannot stress how such a powerful impact being quiet and just being silent can help a leader. Leaders are constantly solving problems. They're just giving solutions left, right, and center. Solution, problem, problem, solution. Like, it's like, that's it. That's their whole purpose. Correct. Or at least they think they do. Like, <laughs> like they think that's, that's basically what they're paid for. You know, your job as a leader is not just to get results, but your job as a leader is also to create more leaders. Absolutely. So you cannot create more leaders if you're constantly just solving all the problems and you're not allowing others or empowering others to learn, right. to fail, to learn, to get back up, to fail again. You need to constantly give them. And, and the thing is, sometimes you just need to be quiet. Like, just like, okay, ask questions instead. You know, mm -hmm. that's what I mean. When I say be quiet, yeah. I mean, don't give the solution. Don't give the solution immediately. Right. Let them work for it. Let them experiment, let them try, let them fail. Because you, you, pain is the best uh, way to learn something. You know, you need to have a little bit of emotion in your mm -hmm. learning journey. That's how we learn and we really learn through our pain and desire. Right. You can either, you know, it's like the carrot and the stick. <laughs> yeah. You either learn with a reward or you, you learn with, with getting <laughs> hit with a stick. So people learn in different ways, let's right. just say that, right. okay? I'm not promoting that you go and uh, you know you beat your, your employees for god's sake don't, don't quote me on this but you know hopefully you know you don't take this out of context but basically what i'm trying to say is there are different ways to lead and different ways to serve Correct. most leaders think serving is i tell them what to do mm -hmm. but they need to understand that sometimes serving or service comes by listening on what they have to say right and that my friend is a very hard skill to master do you think that not listening comes from their own ego or like self-centric ideologies that I am the leader, hence I will be the one speaking? Do you think that is what is stopping them from listening to their subordinates? I think it definitely ego plays a factor in this because I think no one wants to be perceived as not knowing, especially <laughs> if you're the leader. Right. There is a lot of responsibility on a leader to have the answers to questions that no one knows. Right. And what happens is if you don't know, you might lose credibility. You might lose authority. You might lose respect. Mm -hmm. And so it's better to say something rather than to admit, hey, guys, I'll be honest with you. I don't know. You right. know, and the thing is, what's more powerful is if you let your people know that you don't know. Mm -hmm. it humanizes you let me let me give you the scenario so you know in, in arabic leadership or leader is al-qa'id or al-qiyada right and another word that is kind of deriving der deriving from that word is qidwa okay which is role model okay so part of the job of a leader is to have others you know model them right. they are a role model now imagine if you have a leader who never says they don't know who never seems to admit that they've made a mistake, who's, who's never always like facing challenges or pressure. He's always amazing or she's always amazing and they're always great and everything's great and there's no problem. You know, the problems always seem to happen to you as the employee and never to them. Now you, as an employee working with this leader, all you see is like, my God, man, this guy's a machine. I can't, comp I can never be that. Right. I can never be that. Right. And that's the issue. You want them to, you, you want them to see you as role model because that's literally one of the methods of influence is right. for them to see you as a role model. If they cannot see you as a role model because, you know, you're just so perfect, like there's no mistakes, there's no mm -hmm. errors. The guy never admits anything wrong because he's never done anything wrong, or you know, even if they do, he never admits it. So, what happens is you lose that humanity, and you lose that like me or like me too mindset that we right. talked about right. earlier, and so you eliminate or you. You elim eliminate any common ground between you and your team. You, as a result, create 
a barrier mm. almost between yeah. them. And if they cannot see themselves like you, then they can't really, really respect you or they can't really ever become something like you. But the moment you say, hey, listen, I think, uh, I think I'm just like you today. Like, I have no idea how to do this. Ooh, he's just like me. Yeah. Okay, so he, he's lost, I'm lost, we're both lost, great. Okay, so at least he said something about it. Right. Um, you know, when you use that, you start to bring back and you bridge that humanity, you bridge that, um, you know, commonality that you guys share. And then maybe their narrative would be like, you know what, maybe I can see myself being like him. Like, you know what, I would love to be a leader that when I don't know, I say I don't know. Ooh, now that's amazing. Right. That, that's amazing influence right there. Absolutely. That's, that's lovely. You know, in the past five years or so, there's a sudden rush in, in at least Kuwait yeah. where every, everyone is turning to becoming entrepreneurial or starting a startup in have, being in this industry. Why do you think that is such a case? Uh, technology has created immense opportunity. Okay. It's, um, you know, 100 years ago, starting a business oof, was so hard, so difficult, so many challenges. Technology has really come a long way since then, especially now with, you know, AI as well. You know, it's like someone just jump-started the internet all over again. Right. So, um, you know, technology and, and just the way how things have evolved in just the last couple of you know, years uh, has created a very different um, dynamic uh, marketplace. And people now have, more than ever, have uh, the opportunity to start something from nothing. Mm -hmm. And people have now more options. And so you're, you're, starting, you're starting to see a, a much in, you know, high levels of uh, you know, young entrepreneurs yeah. entering the field. Now, it's great, but alarming at the same time because these are very young individuals who are taking massive amounts of responsibility and they, do, and they lack the skill set. Mm -hmm. They, I mean, some of them are smart enough to hire or work with someone who has the skill set, but there's a vast majority who are doing everything by themselves. They're probably doing it without even the knowledge of their parents or their closest friends. And so they're, they're becoming self-leaders, but they're struggling. And the thing is, um, without the proper guidance, without the proper support, mm -hmm. um, it's just going to be, I want to say impossible, but it's definitely going to be not an easy road or path. So I would highly recommend those individuals who embark on this trip you know, uh, find people to support you in this journey, specifically mm -hmm. as, as someone who's starting your own business, specifically as an entrepreneur, specifically as someone who wants to do something very new and it involves a, a sense of leadership. Right. Because you can be a life leader and you can be a business leader and there's a big distinction between those two. But there's a lot of commonality as well. Both of them are leaders, but right. one of them is leading their life, the other is leading their business. Right. What is the number one skill set you would say they need to have in order to jump into the startup industry? Mindset, mindset, mindset. Okay. It, it, I mean, I literally was delivering uh, something very similar to, you know, just like about the entrepreneurial mindset. I was delivering, delivering something very similar uh, on, on this topic uh, to, to actually a very young audience today, ironically. And I was literally the whole day, like f four hours of just pure content around mindset. Wow. It's all about how you perceive the world, right? I'll give you two really powerful questions right now that most leaders have not even considered and they don't understand how powerful their impact, these two questions are impacting their life. Number one, what is your definition of success? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very people important. don't understand the impact of their definition of success. Some people think their definition of success is, oh, I got a lot of money. Someone defines it as, I have free time. Some people define success as not having failures. So you can, you can immediately start to see how each one perceives reality in a very different way. Some people view success, success in a negative connotation. Some view success as a positive. Yeah. I had a great answer today. I view success as if I, you know, I, if I accomplish my goal 
and now I need to go to a higher level. So their definition definition of success is not just hitting the goal, it's hitting the goal and knowing what the next step is. That's a lot of pressure. Right. You know? So you can only imagine on like how a leader is defining their 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 this thing that they call success, but they need to understand what it is because if you know what it is, if you understand it, you can manage it. And if you can manage it, you can achieve it. Second question, what is your personal definition of failure? Can you imagine that success and failure, you'll find people defining success as the lack of failure or avoidance of failure, and you'll find people defining failure as a roadway to success, which is interesting, and it's just one definition, but everyone has a different definition. Some people define failure as when I give up. That's failure. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I tried and failed. And no, no, no. It's like the moment I give up, that's when I failed, which is amazing. Interesting mindset, you know? Right. Some people has, have described these, ter these uh, two questions, whether it's success or failure, as not even a result. Some people have actually defined success and failure as a feeling. So they'll be like, when I feel X that's when I know I have succeeded. And when I feel mm. Y, that's when I know I have failed. So sometimes it's not even linked to a result. And see, this is what you need to understand as a, as a leader. When you're defining what, what success means to you and what failure means to you, you can now understand how you can go about your life. And uh, here's another quick uh, hack, if you want. When you define those two, ask yourself, is, you know, is one the opposite or the other? Like the definitions, are they opposite to one another or not? Oftentimes, you'll, you'll notice that the way you, you've defined success has nothing to do with the way you've defined failure, you know? And, and that's very, exactly, because, you know, when you look at what is the opposite of success, you'll say failure. But when you start to define it, not really. So, right. you know, just food for thought. Right, absolutely. Very interesting. Can I define success, what success means to me? Yeah, by all means, uh, go ahead. Uh, it's going to take some time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, it's not supposed to be easy. It's a very complex uh, concept, especially if you want to shorten the definition down. But like, right. definitely, like, what is success to you? I, I would like to have a balance of um, tangible success. I mean, tangible success like cars and money and big houses or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, philanthropy, like... Mm helping others in the world, becoming better in their lives, solving their problems, um, emotionally, physically, financially as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the most important things is for me is my family. Yeah. I have a wife and two daughters and my mom and dad. So if these, these, four, these four people are well fed, mm -hmm. well satisfied, have a room, have a shelter or something like that, and they're satisfied with what I've provided, I yeah. think that's success to me. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So very holistic, right? Like there's a little bit of emotion. There's a little bit of logic. There's a little bit of, uh, you know, like, uh, let's say materialistic items as well. So it's it, see, like success can be so many things, right? Absolutely. And a better question would be like, you know, how do you define failure? <laughs> That's where <laughs> that, that becomes tricky, right? <laughs> failure. That's really important. It's crucial. Yeah. You know, uh, s sometimes people, they, um, you know, and again, this is some another technique where I tell them, like, listen, if you don't know how to define this thing, find the opposite and define that. And that will determine the, you know, the, the definition that you might be looking for, or, or at least give you a gauge of what right. it is. Right. Right. So you just defined it, defined success for me. So, right. you know, what is what could be a, a personal definition of failure to you? I have a lot of failures, but I don't know if that is the one. I want to answer the one failure that would define my whole life. Mm -hmm. If if my father tells me mm. I'm not up to the mark, mm. I think that is a failure for me because I really look up to him gotcha. and he's like an ideal for me. Yeah. So I don't have a personal definition. I mean, if he says that I didn't do it, I mean, I was not there. Yeah, That's a failure to me. That's very deep. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I know that was not easy. Uh, the, 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 the reality is, is a lot of how we perceive success and failure is crucially and massively linked to 
the environment that we were raised in, mm -hmm. what the, you know, the, the environment we've come from, it helps shape and massively influences, you know, uh, success and failure. And of course, you know, as we grow up and we, we have our own understanding of the way of the world works and like everything, we kind of add to that, remove from it, et cetera, and so on and so forth. But there are some core values that kind of help shape that answer because, right. you know, failure and success, these are values, really. Right. Absolutely. You know, uh, a lot of people value failure because they, you know, like take, for example, Thomas Edison. Mm -hmm. The guy failed over a thousand times to create a light bulb. <laughs> How many people have the discipline to fail that many times and not think that they are a loser? Or not think that they are incompetent or not enough, you know. Now no, that's perseverance, that's determination, that is what success looks like right. for a lot of the times. You know, it's like that. Um, I think when when Michael Jordan, when they asked him, you know, uh, wow, you know, how does it feel to be like, you know, the best scoring, you know, or 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 you know, the top scorer of of you know the NBA, you know, in this year, it's like, yeah, you saw me score that number, but do you know how many times I missed? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like they, I think it was like, yeah, in order for me to get like 3000 or 5000 shots, I had to miss 9000 of them. Damn. So, so it's like, yeah, you want to look at my success as success, but it's a lot of failure and trial and error and opportunities missed and, and days when you're like on your knees and you're crying and why things are not going the way you are, you know? Right. And, uh, but, but that's, that's how people define things, you know, and how you define it influences how you see things right yeah. uh, you're you're clearing out my thoughts about failure i have one more definition that is my personal definition yeah, go ahead i think if after my death mm. people don't remember what i've done for them mm -hmm. or what i've done in life yeah i think that would be a failure for me yeah legacy yeah absolutely yeah Absolutely. Legacy is actually a very, very, uh, it's actually, subhanAllah, it's, it's a very organic, it's very uh, natural, uh, let's say, um, uh, fear uh, that many people experience, or uh, it's just something that people, you know, really want to succeed at, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, sometimes one of the easiest way to, to leave a legacy is just to have children behind, but, you know, what kind of children you leave behind also impacts True. your legacy. But, you know, is it just the children or is it something more to life that you want to leave behind your True. work, you know, your, your fingerprint uh, in humanity's history, if you may. Absolutely. So, so it's, it's a very deep conversation. And, and, and this is, this is the kind of conversation that I want to Dang. ignite with, with, with leaders, you know, I'm having goosebumps. <laughs> Maybe you're just cold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving this conversation. I'm the love, but, but like, you see, like, this is, this is how, and I thank you. I really appreciate how vulnerable you're, you're, you're allowing yourself, uh, you know, given the space we're in and given, you know, the people that are going to view this, but right. the reality is, is you want more people to be vulnerable with themselves like this because it will make them better people. It will make them get clarity on, on things that they're maybe not clear on. It will help shift priorities. The fact that you just mentioned legacy right now uh, and like what you want people to remember you by might literally change how you, you know, you uh, act in the next four months. Absolutely. You know, you're going to, after this conversation is over, you're going to go home, you're going to put your head on the pillow and you're going to sleep and you're going to think about this. And the fact that I'm saying this, I'm just implanting the concept right now. So it's going to happen, guys. You just watch. <laughs> All right. So what's going to happen is you're going to you're going to enter that state and you're like, OK, let me what do I want to accomplish? What do I really want to do? Right. Really? You know, uh, so, so and that's the conversation that you can have with yourself. Really? Uh I don't know. I, I cannot explain. Something's happening to me absolutely right now. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's good. It's good. Uh, it's uh, all good. Don't worry about it. Yeah. It's, uh, no, it's an amazing feeling, though. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. So um, last food for thoughts. Sure. Um, who is one of the greatest leaders, according to you, in the world? Past, present. Ooh. Wow, that's such a big one. You know, I, I've never really thought about it uh, truthfully because I truly believe... There are so many incredible leaders, great examples of what to be and great examples of what not to be, right? Mm. Like you have people, and again, like uh, you, you'll have people like uh, of different backgrounds, different faiths, different ideologies, 
I mean, honestly, even a, a father figure can, can can honestly be a leader. And, and my father is definitely a, a, a leader in my life that right. I've learned so much. There's so many things. And, and the thing is, it, leadership does not come down to one person. Mm-hmm. It comes because, uh, you know, like th- there's no complete uh, individual that, that you can like, damn, in this situation, uh, you know. No, it's situations and you do with the, you know, you, you play your best card and you hope to, to God that is the best right play and you go and, and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, over the course of history, there's so many, so many incredible examples. I mean, you can go from a religious standpoint and you can name half the prophets, if not all of them. Right. Because uh, everyone was in a situation that required massive, massive leadership. Absolutely. You know, what do you do when you have to sacrifice a son? What do you do when when family members are not joining your religion, you know, like there's so much inspiration there. True. And then when you go into politics, there's so many incredible politicians over the years. doesn't matter what you think about politics. At the end of the day, politics is in every single culture in the world. Correct. And it's all about influence. And so you'll find so many politicians, you know, uh, whether they have been assassinated or whether there was ro- war and they were the bad guys, but mm-hmm. still there are elements and, and by the way, leadership is not just about, you know, what you say, but sometimes also how you say it. So it's, it's like how you carry yourself. And again, it has nothing to do whether you're a good person or a bad person, right. it's, you know, whether it's, you know, the perception of history. But you can learn from these individuals of what to do, what not to do. True. And then you want to take leadership into, the, into your, your personal life, you know, the people you know, friends, family, colleagues. Um, who are the people that shine? In every family, there is at least uh, one clear exa- definitive example that you like oh man i really like that 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 character yeah. you know like i really want to build that skill or yeah. i really like want to do it. well yeah and, and here's a here's a quick uh, you know pro tip you know any person you admire any person you admire a certain trait or quality or characteristic about mm-hmm. um, two things are happening one is either you are admiring something that already exists within you and but you haven't fully, you know, reached that level. So it mm-hmm. already exists and you already have that skill set or you already have that trait, but it hasn't lived up to that full potential yet. Right. Or it's something that you maybe don't have, but you're definitely willing to strive for and, and create and learn and, and build the, the, the skill set from scratch. Right. Now, it may not be as cl- crystal clear and smooth as they might have it because it might be organic and natural for them. But you, that's something that you're willing to do. And there's a motivation there. You know, there's right. an as, you know, ins- inspiration to kind of achieve that. So, so those are some things that I would leave uh, the, the viewers with is that if you admire someone who has great leadership skills, you know, often chances, you know, oftentimes the chances are that you're admiring something that already exists within you, but you haven't fully, you know, optimized it to the, to the highest right. degree yet. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Um, some of the books you would recommend to our audience regarding leadership? I would definitely recommend, uh, you know, John C. Maxwell is a great example. Uh, he has a ton of, of books uh, on, on leadership. Honestly, like any book you, you basically grab by, by John C. Maxwell is definitely great, uh, definitely great read. There's always a lot of uh, great examples, frameworks, methodologies. Covey comes to mind, another great example, you know, the, 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 um, the seven uh, habits or the, was it six or seven? I don't know, they keep on changing them <laughs> or they keep adding one. I think the, the, the seven habits of highly effective people. Yeah. And then there's the eighth one, many, many, honestly, but like I can't recall all of them at once. You know, oftentimes I don't have the luxury of reading, actually reading, but I definitely listen to a lot of audiobooks. Like right. I take the time, and and, and uh, here's a nice uh, you know piece of advice for those of you who are great. You know, if you love reading, go for it and do it. But the reality is, you know, the 80-20 rule happens here, which is basically, you know, 80% of the book will be summarized in really 20% of the pages. So mm. if you just focus on that 20%, uh, you'll get the gist of it. Right. Oftentimes, uh, books are basically an actual course but it's just condensed over pages. Really, that's really what it is. So you just need to go and find the core messages of that book, right? Right. So um, I've consumed, dare I say, more than 100 e-books over the course of just like, you know, the last uh, year or two. So so (laughs) I can't definitively recall like uh, many books right now, but honestly, 
if you just take the time, and again, there's more than one way to feed your mind, whether it's reading, actual reading a book, uh, whether it's listening to an audiobook, taking a course, getting trained, getting coached, whatever you do, just do something to feed your mind as a life leader or a business leader. Right. And that's my message. Perfect. I, I enjoyed it a lot and I learned so many things. I mean, I just can't wait to go back to my pillow and unpack <laughs> this podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving your time, You're valuable awesome. time. And I hope the audience learns a lot of things from this podcast because it was jam-packed with valuable content. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. Inshallah, I've uh, been a, yani, of service, and uh, thank you so much for having me. I want to thank you and the crew uh, for putting all this together. And, you know, again, like, should anyone watch this and, you know, still f need more guidance, I'm more than happy to, you know, uh, extend a helping hand. And, you know, you can definitely share my content or my, uh, my you, know, con you know, my contact details. Absolutely. Kind of uh, help that process. So Absolutely. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank the you. pleasure is ours. Thank you. Thank you.